Good afternoon. I am Kelly Brown Douglas, Dean of the Episcopal Divinity School at Union Theological Seminary in New York City. Thank you all for joining us in our Facebook Live conversation on being church in the time of COVID-19. I am so privileged this afternoon to have joining me today one of the leading voices in the Episcopal Church, indeed in the wider faith community. My dear sister friend, the Reverend Canon Stephanie Spellers, who is canon to the presiding bishop for evangelism, reconciliation, and creation care. Thank you, Stephanie, for joining me in this conversation. Oh, thank you for this opportunity. I've been looking forward to it. Well, so have I. Mm -hmm. There is so much to cover that let us jump right in. <laughs> Stephanie, <laughs> from your vantage point as canon to the presiding bishop and with the work that you're doing in the national church, yeah. what would you say it means to be church? in this time of COVID-19? Um, Kelly, I am, I am at once reminded of the words of Archbishop William Temple, mm. um, who said um, you know, in the last century that the church is the only institution that does not exist for itself. And I feel like that that vision it's it's obviously aspirational, you know. Um, from for many of us, when we think of church, especially for church people, we're like, oh, what's the church going to give me? What's the church going to be for me? Um, and it can be kind of insular. I feel like what we are reminded of and really called toward in this moment is that church really does have to be something that you give away. Oh. That the life of the church matters most when we give it away. Um, and so, you know, so I, I see all these churches going online and taking chances, taking risks, being messy, doing all of it. You know, nobody's got the perfect stuff right now. Nobody. Um, everybody's out there, but they, but they have this sense that like, we've got to be out where people are. If people are hurting. We got to be with them. Even if, and if that's online, here we come. Um, and, um. You know, and if it's and if it's in our in our churches, you know, and there are bishops who are saying, now you've got to shut your doors, and then churches that are coming back and saying, we can't. <laughs> like I just talked to a priest today who had had that battle really with his bishop, and of course the bishop wanted to keep everybody safe, but but this priest was like, we've got to have our doors open. You don't understand. We have to feed people. We have to love people. So I feel like we are we are figuring out what it means to have this call to be an institution that does not exist for itself, following a God who, who did not exist for, for God's self. Well, it, it, it reminds us, does it not, of what it means to be church as the embodied reality, right? Mm -hmm. of, uh, of, of Jesus, but the embodied yeah. reality of a God who is incarnate. So it mm -hmm. takes us beyond what it means to be a religious institution that happens to talk about God, right? right it takes right. us beyond our church walls. Uh, it reminds us that the center of what it means to be church isn't all about worship, and while well, worship significant, but I'm also interested even as you said, I've got to keep my church doors open, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we bring people together to worship. Uh, there's right. a sense of ethical, irresponsibility when yeah. you do that. See, this, this priest was saying, and I love this, like he wasn't fighting for, I've got to keep my church open because we've got to worship. Mm -hmm. Like they found ways immediately of worshiping. He was saying, we are the source for food that's for right. so many people, you know, and that's Jesus at the door right now. I've got to go let him not, not let him in again. They're like, they, they worked out a way to be able to, um, it's, it's pretty ingenious. I think it's, it's actually what a lot of, of soup kitchens and other ministries, food ministries are doing where like people drive up and they honk mm -hmm. <laughs> and a volunteer from the church. And there aren't many volunteers who can come out as much anymore, but whoever is working this ministry still, they come out, they say, what do you need? Mm -hmm. <laughs> they call out from the car. We need this, this, this. You're like, we need some, you know, whatever. We need canned this and all of that. 
and they go inside and they pack it up and they bring it out and they place it on the on the doorstep, shut the door, and then that hungry neighbor is able to come out of their car or out of whatever their vehicle, pick it up, go back. That's why he was fighting to stay open. Yeah, and it, it reminds me of uh, what even uh, the Bishop of DC, a uh, Marian buddy uh, once said, which is just because we can't worship together doesn't mean we're going to stop being church. Right. And, and so that's right. what you're describing. Stephanie, I, we will get back to this in a minute, but I, I wanna, you are also canon for creation care. And right. I wanna talk about this uh, just a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, to, not to minimize in any way the toll that this uh, coronavirus has taken on human life across the globe. Mm -mm. There is also wisdom to yeah. be gained from this crisis mm -hmm. if we would but listen. You know, crisis also means opportunity, like Kairos, yes. it's, an, it's an opportunity. For sure, during this time, we are reminded of how connected we all are as this virus is not a respecter of the arbitrary borders we construct, be they right uh, geographical, systemic, structural, or ideological borders. Mm -hmm. This virus also reminds us of the preciousness, yet fragility, of human life. Yes. At the same time, it reminds us of the impact that we have upon God's creation. It reminds us of the impact that we have upon our environment. For if anything good has come from this pandemic, during this time that the world has shut down, mm -hmm. we have seen a gross reduction of our carbon footprint. There has been decline in carbon emissions across oh, yeah. the world. Mm -hmm. The proportion of days with good air quality in certain cities globally has gone up. Canals in urban areas are beginning to clear up. Mm -hmm. Wild animals are showing back up, uh, to, uh, and we hear birds singing again, right? Now, uh, you know, too bad it takes a pandemic mm -hmm. to slow us down and to help us to realize the fragility of our creation and the impact, the negative impact we have had upon it, in spite of what some folks might suggest. So my question to you as a canon of creation care, mm -hmm. not what can the church do, but what must the church do to take advantage of this moment to make sure that the lesson is learned and that we don't find ourselves returning to normal when it comes to the destruction of our environment? Mm. Mm. What's our call? What call do you hear as canon of creation care? First of all, I hear that I'm going to take the recording of what you just said and just <laughs> put that up everywhere. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> um, so we had already been working on a creation care covenant and the executive council had approved it. And it's this just beautiful vision for how Episcopalians can take our part in loving God by caring for the creation that God made and loves. and one part of that was developing a more loving relationship with creation, telling our stories of love for creation, um, and, and living more simply, living more simply, and actually practicing reordering our lives so that um, we use less travel, less, just lots of, lots of life changes. So we had already mapped a lot of that. Lots of folk have who are engaged in the care of creation. Um, what I find fascinating is a lot of the things that we have been proposing to people about, about what they could be doing. Mm -hmm. it's, and people would say, oh, but I can't do that. Like you know, Zoom, I can't, right? I, can't, I can't fly less and use Zoom to do meetings. <laughs> I can't drive less. Um, I can't consume less. You know, and you know, like the idea that that whatever you have in your kitchen, use that before you go out and get more stuff. You know, um, and so part of what's happened is that the lives that we have have crafted out of necessity, um, out of crisis, end up looking not so different from <laughs> the lives that 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 actually we we have been invited into 
just as a part of care creation. So my hope is that, that when we come out of this, that people don't immediately just jump back onto planes That's right. for everything. And I say that honestly for my own work, um, that you know, I work for the, the church-wide offices and we travel so much, fly so much, and it's a part of being in this interconnected church. We're not gonna do as much of that. I just, I know it in my bones. Mm -hmm. We now understand that we can be connected in other ways, ways that care for this earth that God made and loves. And we will, we'll, we'll do more of that. Um, you know, I, I have a different relationship with my kitchen. <laughs> like, I'm not going to be going and getting, and I live in New York City. We love our takeout. Lord, how we love our takeout. <laughs> I've been cooking so much more, cooking whole foods. And I know where my food is coming from because I made it. Um, and and I, I kind of don't want to go back to all of the processed stuff. I don't want to go back to outsourcing all of the making of my food and having it delivered in plastic containers. And just um, there's a simplicity that we have taken on that I hope we can breathe into and value and, and, and then recommit to as we come out of this crisis, whenever that time comes. Yeah, uh, well said. And well, here's what we do know. There have been past uh, crises, yep. right? Whether it was the economic recession of mm -hmm. 2008, yeah. or, or we uh, can even look back in history in terms of the Black Plague or the Spanish flu of uh, 1919. And we've seen this kind of sort of uh, sh shall we say, uh, check and balance in terms of the environment. But as soon as it's over, tick, 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 uh, yeah. back up. And, and, and then we find ourselves again in a situation where we have leadership uh, in various quarters suggesting that, no, we, aren't, we don't have a large uh, carbon footprint or we don't need to cut back right. on carbon emissions. So the church, Yes, uh, we have this responsibility ethically uh, to help people to live in a different way in relationship to our environment. But the church is also an institution yes. and a social institution. So what, what do you see uh, to be the responsibility of the church as a social institution in terms of having an impact? Uh, on our policies uh, in terms of our political policies, et cetera, uh, our laws, et cetera, in terms of pushing forward now an agenda that says, no, uh, we have to boldly speak the truth about our human impact on our environment and the care of God's creation. Yeah, well, and let's be clear that even as we are, even as we are experiencing the physical distancing, not social, but physical distancing. Mm -hmm. um, and even as Americans are making extraordinary sacrifices, people all over the world are. Like at the same time, uh, like in March, Congress was meeting and considering, reconsidering a number of um, the treaties or land agreements with indigenous communities. That's right. And finding ways of taking land from them changing the way that, that indigenous communities direct their own lives and their land, for instance. While everybody was looking the other way, right. they were swooping in, right. um, you know, that this, this trillion dollar, trillions of dollars that they're putting toward, um, toward the relief, you know, and, and restart of the economy, you know, a big chunk of that, you know, we already know this, we're watching it happen. You know, the fossil fuel industry is in there saying, hey, if you're going to be commissioning a whole lot of work, um, you know, and possibly even transportation infrastructure, make sure that you don't include those awful regulations, because that will just slow things down and we need to do this fast. Um, so, so like even before we come out of this, <laughs> there is work that we have to be doing right now. We have to, I hate that phrase, but the whole like chew gum and walk at the same time. Um, like we've got to be able to keep our eye, our hearts committed to, um, to understanding what is the human toll, uh, the immediate human toll that this virus, um, you know, is, is, is taking. And 
and catch the opportunist because they see an opportunity too. Let's be clear. <laughs> In this crisis, they see that that a lot of people want urgency, and they're like, maybe that urgency means no one will care if we if we just strip the environmental regulations um, and say it's a free for all. Build whatever you need to build as long as you're employing people. Yeah, and, and see to have to engage in the policy realm in order to. You know, I I personally rely on Episcopal um, Public Policy Network, EPPN, um, which is run by the Office of Government Relations. I rely on them for the alerts that they send. And they've managed, like they're still sending stuff out around about census. They're still sending things out around environment. Um, it's not just COVID related. Um, so when they tell me, make a call because stuff's going down in Washington, I'm like, thank you. <laughs> and I hope everybody else is watching for that too. No, I think you, you were so right. We we can't take our eye off the ball of the politics mm -hmm. of environmental care. And this this is what what you're speaking to is what the Jesus movement is all about. It is at once prophetic and pastoral, right? Yeah. And if we're talking about the Jesus that was crucified on the cross, that means it's always political. Uh, uh, Let's be clear, the Jesus who was crucified on the cross is the only Jesus I know. Exactly, <laughs> which means that that Jesus movement that moves through the cross is always also political. Exactly. Uh, uh, so let, let, let's, let me look at another aspect of uh, creation care mm -hmm. because there, is a, another aspect of it that again has been so revealed uh, through this uh, COVID crisis. And that is God's, uh, the human part of God's creation. Yes. Uh, this COVID crisis has revealed to us in so many respects, the ongoing but often ignored crises in this country that are the crucifying realities of systemic injustice and gross inequities. Because of the systemic, structural inequities and racial bias in this country, we are seeing it, uh, that the very communities who are disproportionately impacted uh, by these systems and structures of inequity are also disproportionately impacted by the realities of uh, this COVID-19. Yes. Uh, not the least of which, of course, is the uh, Black community. Mm -hmm. So. You know, in many respects, this is an indictment on our democracy, if you will, revealing the fact that to call ourselves a democracy is at best aspirational, mm. but it is also an indictment on the church yeah. as these crucifying realities have happened on our watch. Mm -hmm. So perhaps, you know, uh, it is aspirational as you've just said earlier for us to even call ourselves church for this crisis is showing us the ways in which we have fallen short yes. of what that means. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I want to ask you, particularly for our church, the Episcopal Church, what does it mean for a church like ours, which is well over 90% white, that has been historically the church and sometimes proud of it in uh, uh, contemporary times, the church of the wealthy. It has historically been the church of wealthy slave owners. Mm -hmm. Yet it's a church that claims to take seriously the movement of the one who was crucified. Mm -hmm. My Lord. Mm -hmm. So what's that mean for us when we look around and see the way the COVID crisis has revealed the ways in which we have not been church to those who Jesus, uh, through his crucifixion, was in solidarity with. Mm. And what's it mean, Stephanie, by the way, for evangelism? Yeah, oh, okay, okay. <laughs> um, there are two words that are coming to me as, as I'm hearing and just reflecting with you, Kelly, and um, those words, and they're, they're related, but one is repentance and the other is solidarity. Mm. Um, and so maybe there's, maybe one comes before the other perhaps, but um, there, is a, there is the work of repentance. Um, and for the record, that's what you have to do on your way toward revival. Um, <laughs> and so maybe that does take us to evangelism eventually. But, um, but that, that it is, I, I've had, I've actually, I, I posted on Facebook about this a couple of days ago that I'm, 
I've had a really hard time finding the words to say like how I'm dealing with everything that's unfolding because um, I keep seeing the systemic, um, I keep reading this through the system lens. Mm -hmm. and, and I keep seeing that, that we are reaping what, we, what our nation has sowed. Um, you know, that there's, it's not a coincidence that more black and brown people and native peoples um, and, in, and, and in New York, some of the poorest communities are actually Asian communities. So they're in there too. Um, but, that, but it's not a coincidence that we are the ones who are dying more because because black lives have never mattered. That's right. Um, and right. so of course we disappear the fastest. Um, you know, like that that the idea that that Congress was was really struggling, not about, I'm just gonna say it now, not about giving a twelve hundred dollar stimulus to people right. who make seventy five thousand dollars, you know, like or or less, I guess, or one hundred fifty thousand in a household, I think. Um I'm like wait, you still have your job. That's right. Why do you need this money? But then they thought the reason that it was held up was because they're like, oh, but we're giving way too much to people who are unemployed. You know, that extra 600, that's more than many of them were getting in their unemployment or in their regular paycheck. And I'm like, and you think that was okay? Right. <laughs> like, I just, like, I, I'm watching this play out and, and, and we are literally like we are like there is this feeling of being stuck physically, but also just like wondering how do you fight a system so just bloody evil? Um, and and you know that the reason that they don't want to give that money to to people who are unemployed is because they picture us. They That's picture they're like when they picture who gets that stimulus check, they picture white people. When they picture who gets the unemployment check, they picture us. That's, That's not true. That's, That's right. not, I come from Kentucky where there are plenty of unemployed white folk, plenty of, um, and plenty, but, but, but that's who they picture. And that's, but the idea that that was the struggle to me was you don't care if we live or die. That's right. It's, that's right. You don't care if we live or die. And in fact, and I'm just going to like, you told me that I could be honest on here. And so yeah, like, that's indeed, I'm a, I'm a, I'm going to go here too, and I'm, but I'm sure other people have thought it, maybe even said it too, is that there is the ambivalence that we see among many of our leaders about, about responding to this crisis. I am convinced it is tied to a longstanding agenda to eliminate communities of color in America. Well, I don't- Blackness, anti-brownness, all of that. I'm like, I kind of, I, I, I wonder, and it's just a wondering question, if there are people who feel like COVID-19 is doing what they were trying to do by booting, you know, um, undocumented peoples out of the country. By trying to make America people. great again, right? Exactly, yeah, sending Black people to Liberia, whatever. It's like COVID is accomplishing the reduction of the, of the, the population of color in America. Of course, they're not fighting it with everything they've got. So <laughs> certainly the question, because I, I agree. So the question becomes, I'm sorry, what, what then is the church's, we, we have to, yeah. right? if we're going to be church, step into this, because just as you said, those of us who have been considered expendable are now being considered disposable, and this Van Jones's or uh, uh, Charles Bull, there'll be this racial explosion, and when it finally becomes uh, centered in these uh, poor communities of color, do you, will the government respond with the same kind of urgency? So what's the church's responsibility in this? Not to cut you off, but to get you to yeah, uh, yeah. speak to that. Yeah, uh, I mean, I think again, like the church's response and that's where the solidarity part comes in. Mm -hmm. So there's a repentance piece and then there's solidarity. Um, and so, and this is something that I've heard you say and that I have felt and, and tried to act on in whatever ways I could of moving into solidarity with the crucified class. That's right. Um, and, and that's not abstract. That is not abstract. <laughs> to say that we move into solidarity is to say that, that, for instance, you know, lots of our churches are in areas where that's people are suffering like this. Um, and in many of those churches, maybe the members of the church are people who drove in from someplace much more comfortable. Uh, and maybe a diocese was figuring out, well, we don't have a vibrant presence here anymore, so maybe we need to close this church. Um, I think 
perhaps some of solidarity with the crucified class is saying, actually, we're not gonna close this building, or if we do, we will take all the proceeds from what we do and use it for the healing of the nations, for the repair of the breach. It won't just get absorbed into some you know, diocesan endowment you know, that, that kicks off a little bit of money at a time. We will actually use the funds from some of these closed black churches and closed um, urban congregations. We'll use that in order to reinfuse life, to bring revival in those very communities. Um, that would be a part of us moving into solidarity. That's one example, but that's, that's, that's how concrete it looks. So, uh, so well said. So that from your lips to our ecclesial hierarchy's ears uh, and to uh, the uh, rectors, et cetera, ears of some of uh, these churches and communities of privilege. And Can I say one thing based on that? Kelly, yeah. like I'm, I'm interrupting you and I'm sorry, but another, <laughs> another part of moving into solidarity with the crucified class, and this has gotten to me for years, it's like, if you are a member of a church, and I'm looking directly at the day, if you are a member of a church that has been working on or will at some point in the future work on some massive building project where you're gonna spend $10 million, $20 million, even $3 million um, on restoring your organ, <laughs> on, um, on building new spaces that are gorgeous and honestly better than is necessary because it's what you're used to. Please don't just tithe, don't just do 10%. Like that would be great. Like that would be more than many do. But actually like consider that, you know, now we see the interconnectedness and our worship in these beautiful spaces and our investment at such a degree. I'm not saying let your churches collapse, nobody's saying that. But you don't have to spend $20 million on your building when the crucified class is at your door. Yes. Or if you do spend it, then spend 10 million on the build or spend that 20 million on the building, but make half of it affordable housing, genuinely affordable housing. Um, I mean, just, we can't call ourselves Christian and use our resources in that way. Jesus is watching, he's that, at that door. That's right, and that, and yeah. that, that, uh, so I mean, that's why you're canon for evangelism because that's what evangelism looks like. Mm -hmm. Let me let me dig a little bit. We've, we're running out of time, so I'm going to dig in this a little bit more and then come to a, a, a final question. Mm -hmm. And that is this: as you talk about that, and you're talking about this gross inequity even within our denomination, right? So that we have endowed parishes. And we see during this COVID crisis that it's even revealing that inequity for, we have parishes that are ha having webinars on how to raise money during the uh, time of COVID. While we have other struggling parishes trying to figure out how they can feed the hungry. We've got parishes who were ready to ramp up and go online and do live stream worship services, where we have other parishes that are not equipped to do that, just as the communities for which they serve have no access uh, to internet. And so there is this gross inequity within our own church that COVID, we've known about it, but it is only made more clear and more real. What, I think you've already said it, but uh, I want you to say it again so that everybody hears it. What, do, how, what does that mean for mm -hmm. us as a church? When you talk about repentance, it seems to me that this denomination that is more than 90% white needs to repent, turn around, mm -hmm. claim the sin of, of white privilege and do something different. Mm -hmm. And remember this, Kelly, we're not just a church that's 90% white. We're also the church that, according to the Pew Report on Religion in America, has the highest proportion of people who make more than one hundred thousand dollars a year. So this is a church that 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 draws, that welcomes people of every race who have a certain educational level, a certain economic level. Honestly, folk like us, um, you know, like they they love when we walk in the door. <laughs> Many do. Um, not always, not especially once we open our mouths. But so I just wanted to name that there's a racial component, there's a class component, and that the repentance in my mind has to be on all of those fronts. Um, 
And so, so, so yes, repent. Yes, acknowledge, tell the truth, tell the stories. And we were already doing a lot of this around becoming beloved community, which is the Episcopal Church's long-term commitment to racial healing, justice, and reconciliation. Um, we were already doing a lot of storytelling in the way that we understand now what evangelism is. Um, I hope that we will continue to tell the stories, tell the truth about who we have been and who we long to become in Christ. Um, what kind of communities we have been, our congregations, as well as as a denomination, and what does beloved community look like where we are? Um, and so name that and then commit. And that's the solidarity. Commit to living like a beloved community. Commit to looking around your neighborhood and finding, you know, finding out where's the crucified class? Where's the crucified Christ? He's, he may be inside, he's outside, he's across the tracks. Um, he's, he's in the town next door that was created so that your town didn't have to put its tax dollars into that one. Hello, you know, <laughs> I mean, like tell the stories and then, and then repair that breach. Because, and again, if there's anything this crisis has revealed to us, yes, it has revealed these, these divisions, these hierarchies, but it's also revealed our interconnectedness. And that if you thought it was okay that someone else could live like that and somehow it didn't affect you, that was a lie. It's always been a lie, but now we know it to be a lie. Um, that, that that suffering around the corner will eventually become your suffering. Um, so, so wake up now, wake up now, because we are all dying together. Um, and in Christ, I have to believe this, we can all rise together. Yeah. And that's the role of the church. And that's good news. That's not just proclaiming good news, but being good news. And that's yeah. really evangelism, by the way. <laughs> no, that, that's, 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 and embody it. And if we're not, if we're only talking good news, but the embodiment is still, a, you know, a, a white supremacist elite institution, then the good news, it doesn't sound like good news kind of coming out of our mouths. So we have to make that change yeah, or it's, it's not an authentic proclamation of good news. And, and it's certainly not uh, a church that is living into the call to be the Jesus movement. No. Uh, and it, so it sounds like when we talk about reconciliation that the church quote unquote needs to reconcile itself back to uh, the cross of Jesus yes. in so many ways. Stephanie, we are over time and out of time. So I want to leave with one last question and that is simply this. What is the message that uh, in, in, in brief that you would want to leave uh, the church with and those who are listening with, particularly as we're coming up on Easter? Um, we are this human family of God. We are just, um, as a whole creation, we are the family of God. And, and I suppose it's really what I was just saying, that if we ever were under the illusion that, that some of us had some form of life separated from others, we know that to be the lie that it always was. Um, and that, that, that in Christ, we die together, we rise together. And, and it, with COVID-19, we are dying together. Will we rise together? And that's the question for me to walk with this Holy Week and really every day that we move forward. I hope we'll rise together. Reverend Canon Stephanie Spellers, mm -hmm. I can't thank you enough for this very pro provocative conversation. And I hope that the conversations continue uh, with people who are listening and that uh, those in our church are provoked to begin to really live into that claim of what it means to be church as you have so laid out for us. You and I could go on all day, uh, okay. as we often do. I want to thank you. And even as I give a shout out to our uh, sister who is not here, uh, Winnie Varghese, and tell her to save some of that popcorn for us. But well. <laughs> thank you, Stephanie. Mm -hmm. Thank all of you who are listening. And we certainly do wish you a joyous, Easter.
Amen. Amen.